Penn Future and 12 regional partners published Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed in December 2020. Amongst its insights, Penn Future and its partners identified surface runoff as the number one threat to water quality in the region. Here to discuss that are two of Penn Future's campaign managers for clean water advocacy, Sarah Bennett and Renee Reber, who will discuss the impacts of stormwater runoff that they can have on water quality and what can be done to reduce these impacts. Hello and welcome to a special digital program, a joint effort between the Jefferson Educational Society and Penn Future. I'm Ben Spagan, I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Uh, before we get to their presentations, a bit more about each of the presenters. Sarah Bennett, who we'll hear from first, is Penn Future's Campaign Manager for Clean Water Advocacy in the Lake Erie Watershed. She earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in zoology at Michigan State University. After earning her degrees, uh, Sarah spent 13 years teaching biology at the college level. She served as the chairperson of the biology department and co-director of the environmental science program at Mercyhurst University for two years and was also their sustainability officer for two years. Uh, Sarah is a member of the Northwest Pennsylvania chapter of Sigma Chi and the university representative uh, on Keep Erie County Beautiful Advisory Committees. Uh, she has organized many litter and dump site cleanups in the area. Now, Renee Reber, uh, who we'll hear from second, uh, leads Penn Future's clean water advocacy efforts in the Susquehanna Basin and serves as the Pennsylvania state lead for the Choose Clean Water Coalition and the Coalition of the Delaware River Watershed. Uh, Renee works to strengthen state efforts to improve the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, she has spearheaded the revision and publication of PA Clean Water Legislative Briefing Book, and she organizes Clean Water Education Week for state legislatures each year. She holds a bachelor's degree in environmental geography and a master's degree in environmental studies, both from Ohio University. When she is not hard at work, she enjoys spending uh, her time exploring Penn's woods and water. Uh, folks, before we turn it over to our presenters, who will each share their insight, knowledge, expertise, and experience, uh, a few programmatic notes. Now, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're gonna work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this event, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going and to stay engaged. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, visit our website, jeserie.org. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information about Penn Future, please visit penfuture.org and be sure to find them on the social platforms too. Now to get us started, I'd like to turn things over to Ms. Sarah Bennett. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation on storm water runoff, its impacts and solutions. Thank you, Ben. I'm happy to be here again. So as Ben mentioned, we're here today to continue the conversation about uh, Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. And today we'll be diving in to take a look at the at surface runoff, specifically stormwater runoff and its impacts and then solutions for addressing those impacts. Um, as Ben mentioned, we identified in the common agenda surface runoff as the number one threat to clean water in Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. Um, and so I, I'm gonna start by talking to you about what stormwater is, what the storm, uh, what stormwater systems look like and the impacts that stormwater has on water quality. And then Renee will have the, the much more fun job of talking about how we can address those impacts. Um, so thank you for being with us today. So I wanted to start by just, and you know, if you're if you're listening, I'm sure that you and you're from the Erie region, you know that our water resources provide a backdrop to our daily lives. In this way, um, so they also contribute greatly to our local economy. Um, tour, tourism brings people from all over the country to enjoy our beaches, to fish in our streams, to boat in Presque Isle Bay, and just generally enjoy our water resources. So tourism in Erie County is a $1.2 billion industry. Um, we also have a $40 million fishing industry and a $23 million agricultural, agricultural industry that relies on our abundant freshwater resources, in addition to many breweries and wineries that also rely on these resources. But as much as we love our waterways, it's important that we um, use them wisely. 
this image that you're looking at right here, um, all of the waterways identified in red, including Lake Erie and Presque Isle Bay, are considered impaired by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so it's important that as we use them, we take care of them. Uh, the common agenda identifies the need to take steps to improve impaired waters and protect them from additional harm, as well as protecting um, waters that are not currently impaired so that they don't become impaired. So in the common agenda, like I said, surface runoff was identified as the number one threat to water quality. Surface runoff as we use it is a really broad term. It includes agricultural runoff, failing septic systems, and stormwater runoff. So with, with this slide, I just want to take a minute to address agricultural runoff and failing septic systems. And then the remainder of our presentation will focus on stormwater. So agricultural runoff is an issue nationwide. Um, the fertilizers and pesticides used to grow our crops can run off into our waterways. Um, in the common agenda, we do identify that this does happen in Erie County. Um, and in order to address this, so the common agenda recommends solutions to these threats as well. Um, we have an existing program that is um, implemented by the Erie County Conservation District called the Pennsylvania Vested in Environmental Sustainability Program. Um, this is a great program where uh, grape growers in the region can voluntary, voluntarily participate in the program and implement conservation efforts to protect our waterways um, as they're growing grapes. And so in the common agenda, we recommend an expansion of this program so that more grape growers are included and an expansion to include additional agricultural um, operations in the county. Regarding failing septic systems, um, Erie County is actually kind of unique. Our, our soil leads to septic systems failing earlier than in other places. And so this is an especially big issue in Erie County. Um, and so it's important that we have funding to help homeowners and uh, property owners address um, septic system maintenance and replacement. And so to address these issues in Erie County, we recommend at the state level, increased funding be available to addressing these septic system issues. But locally, we can also make decisions like avoiding um, zoning variances and preventing urban and suburban sprawl that lead to the need for septic systems and small flow treatment systems. And like I said, the remainder of the presentation will be on stormwater runoff. And I'll also point that in the common agenda, there are several other recommendations that we make for addressing these, not just the few that I've shared here. So I wanted to take a minute to explain kind of the typical stormwater systems, and I'm gonna do this fairly quickly. Um, most of our systems now are sanitary system, sanitary sewer systems. And in the image that you see on the right here, you can see that these are, you can see what this looks like. So what we have in a sanitary sewer system is a separation of sewage that comes from our homes and our businesses and stormwater. So in this image on the left, the, the pipe carrying brown materials is sewage that is heading to the wastewater treatment facility. The pipe on the right, the gray pipe that's carrying blue water is a stormwater pipe. And so those are separated in this sanitary system. Um, and then I'll point out also that the stormwater pipe is carrying stormwater and everything that it picks up directly into our streams, Presque Isle Bay and Lake Erie. And that may seem, <laughs> that may seem at first, I mean, that, it, that does lead to pollution and we're going to talk about that today, but it is important that these are separated because otherwise the wastewater treatment facility can get overwhelmed. We can see major backups um, that can lead to sewage problems as well. An older type of system is a combined sewer system. In this case, sewage and stormwater drain into a single pipe. Um, back in the 1800s when these were um, most common, that both the sewage and the stormwater would just drain directly into our waterways. Um, but over time, you know, we've, we've recognized the damage that this has had on our waterways. And so we've implemented 
different methods to um, separate these systems. And so what happens now when combined, often um, when there are combined sewer systems is there's a weir or it's kind of like a dam that under normal dry conditions shunts both the stormwater and the sewage off to the wastewater treatment facility. But when we have really wet weather, heavy rainfall and snow melt, then you can get an overflow of that system that leads to the sewage um, overflowing into our waterways. In Erie, we do have a few of these combined sewer overflows left. Um, this is a, a screenshot that I took of the city of Erie's real-time sewer overflow system. Um, and if you take a look at the map, you can see four, the, the four current um, locations where we monitor combined sewer overflows in the city of Erie. And the green indicates that there is not currently an ongoing overflow issue. And that makes sense because we haven't had any recent snow melt or um, major rain events. So I just wanted to point this out that, that the city of Erie and other municipalities are required by the EPA to monitor these in real time and um, make it available to the public. So up to this point, what I what I hope that you have the main points that I hope that you've learned are most uh, most storm, most systems are sanitary systems, but there are some combined sewer overflows that still exist, um, and that storm drains lead directly to our streams, Presque Isle Bay or Lake Erie. And so what we're going to look at moving forward is the impact of stormwater on our waterways. And the next thing I'm gonna talk about is how stormwater carries pollutants directly into the environment. So for each of these, I'm just gonna list a few of these pollutant categories and, and just talk about the impact that they can have in the environment. First of all, fertilizers. When we apply fertilizers to our lawns or when businesses apply fertilizers to their lawns, um, that can lead to those fertilizers excess fertilizer that's not used by those plants will run off into storm systems, into the storm drains and out into our waterways. The problem there is that these fertilizers that are mostly nitrogen and phosphorus are going to contribute nutrients to, they're, they're nutrients to algae um, in the waterways. And so excess nutrients are going to lead to algal blooms and in Erie, we're pretty familiar with harmful algal blooms, which are specific algae that can produce toxins. Pesticides also can be applied to our lawns or to our, our buildings um, and also to our agricultural lands. And excess pesticides can run off into our waterways and kill non-target species or, or cause you know, sublethal effects on non-target species. The problem there is especially with macro invertebrates. If you've ever um, gotten into the stream and, and dug up on the bottom, you may have found these big, big um, insect larvae or nymphs. Those are called macro invertebrates and they're really good um, indicators of pollution. And so pesticides can kill them and they serve a really important role in ecosystems. Um, they're food for a lot of smaller fish and other uh, wildlife. Pet waste is an important one because, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand why it's not, you know, it, they might see leaving your dog poop on the, in the yard as a nuisance, but it actually isn't is a um, threat to our water quality as well. The issue is that pet waste when left on lawns is going to run off into these storm drains and directly into our waterways carrying with them all kinds of pathogens, bacteria, viruses, and other parasites that um, can harm wildlife and also decrease our water quality. Litter is probably, if I asked anybody what the, what the, the biggest problem is, is they would probably say litter. Um, anything that is picked up by stormwater and carried down that drain is going to get into our waterways. Um, plastic pollution is especially a big problem. And once it gets out into our water, it's going to be broken down by wind and sun 
and waves into microplastics and just add contribute to the major plastic crisis that we have. Salt is, an, is another big issue, especially in the winter and in the um, spring when we have snow melt. Salt can lead to higher salinity in waterways, which changes the water quality uh, for wildlife in those waterways. And then the last, the last pollutant category that I want to mention is vehicle pollution. And you probably initially what you think of is, you know, maybe oil leaks or, or transmission fluid leaks. So all of those are, are petrochemical pollutions. Um, so definitely those exist and they're going to run off into our waterways and can, they're really difficult to clean up and sometimes impossible. But we also, through wear and tear on our vehicles, have metals that um, are released onto our waterways and can be can run off into our waterways um, and add heavy metals to our water as well. The next impact that I wanna talk about in addition to pollution with stormwater impacts is the impact that rapid conveyance of stream of water, of stormwater into streams can have on those streams. So uh, the image on the right is showing a stream that has suffered stream bank erosion. Um, what happens, and this is a big, this is a big issue with streams in the Erie region, is that when stormwater rushes into these streams, it causes them to rise really quickly, but then they're going to drop really quickly too. And that's going to lead to this stream bank erosion. Issue with that, in addition to losing the stream bank, is also that that can that leads to sedimentation downstream, and so all of the erosion, all of that eroded soil that has come from the stream bank, also carries pollutants with it, and is going to carry those pollutants downstream. Um, and then finally, I want to mention that if if storm water comes in really quickly into a stream, and that stream rises really quickly, that can lead to flooding issues too. I want to also mention the impact of impervious surfaces on stormwater. Um, I'll step back for just a minute and I want everybody to think about if you're, if you're in the woods and it starts and it's raining, that rain is falling and it's, it's able to soak into the soil. And there are lots of plants to also help absorb that water. And so under natural conditions, like a forest, the water is going to have be absorbed, it's going to be absorbed by the land. And so it's going to move more slowly into streams. It's also going to be filtered by those plants as it moves into those streams. And so that's really how nature intends for water to be added to streams. What in the human built environment, and I have Erie here on the screen, um, but this is the case for all built environments. We've covered the surface of the earth with pavement, um, whether that's roads or sidewalks or parking lots, we've covered it with buildings and we have really impact, um, compacted soil as well. And so what hap the impact that that has on stormwater is it causes the stormwater to move more quickly, resulting in an in increased volume very quickly um, into our streams, uh, which so, in that way, impervious surfaces add to the problem that storm problems that stormwater causes. Um, there have been several studies that look at the that compare the percent of impervious surface to stream quality, and this image is is demonstrating the results of of some of those studies. Um, what we see in this image on the left is that with less than 5% impervious surface, we have really high quality streams. But as impervious surface percentage increases, the stream quality decreases. And basically once you get to that 10% impervious surface, um, you're going to start to have really low quality streams. So we have a lot of, a lot of research to demonstrate the impacts of stormwater. Um, and in the human built environment on our stream quality. Um, 
it, and so what Renee is going to tell you about is how do we use that information or how has that information been used to develop best management practices and, and solutions to these issues. So with that, I'm going to hand things off to my colleague, Renee Reber, and she gets to share the, the good news with you <laughs> now that I've depressed you with our, our, with our stormwater, stormwater woes. Thank you, Sarah, and hopefully you all can hear me. I should be off mute now. Good, I'm getting the thumbs up. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my presentation here and um, let's see, go into present mode if I can move things around on my screen. There we go, great, wonderful. Um, yeah, so my name is Renee Reber. I um, I live in the central region of the state. I live in, in, live in Harrisburg area. Um, and as Ben indicated, a lot of my work is um, focused in the Chesapeake and Delaware River watersheds. Um, and I've done some, some work on, on stormwater solutions. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the regulations that um, are there to clean or protect our streams. And I'm going to talk about a certain best management practice called green stormwater infrastructure. So some examples of that um, and, and how that is a, a great solution to stormwater management. And then uh, lastly, I'll, I'll touch on some, some backyard things you can do um, at your house to um, help slow down and, and filter the um, stormwater runoff. So Sarah, you, you saw this, this Sarah showed the impaired, impairment map for um, Erie County. And this is taking a step back and, and looking across the whole state and how is, our, how is our stream health in Pennsylvania. And we are blessed to have 86,000 miles of stream, um, which is the, the densest land to water ratio anywhere in the United States. Um, however, one third of those are impaired um, and, and the leading causes um, across the entire state are agriculture, acid mine drainage, but um, close behind those urban stormwater runoff is the third leading cause of um, our streams not um, meeting the standards that they should. And so very quickly, I know there's a lot of text on this slide. I just wanted to touch on the the laws that kind of govern these um, stormwater regulations that I'm going to go into a bit about. Um, so at the federal level, we have the, the Clean Water Act, which was um, first passed in 1972, and that really sets the, the standard at the national level. Um, but at the state level, we have the Pennsylvania Clean, Clean Streams Law. And as you can see, that was enacted in 1937. So that came a bit before um, um, the federal laws. And uh, we also, in 1978, had the Stormwater Management Act passed, Act 167. And that requires uh, counties to um, um, pass uh, countywide um, stormwater ordinances. And, uh, and these are based on um, stormwater, um, I'm sorry, they're based on watersheds. <laughs> and, um, and then in turn, municipalities will make pass an ordinance that is in um, compliance with the county level ordinance. Uh, and then, so yeah, at the local level, you can have various different ordinances from stormwater to shade trees to open space, all, all great things that can um, help protect our waterways. And in Pennsylvania, we are, um, we have the Environmental Rights Amendment, which is Article 1, Section 27 of our state constitution. It's the, um, the 50th year anniversary of, of, of this, um, passed in 1971. And so if you haven't heard of it, I just wanted to share um, in our constitution, it says that the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Um, so with that, I will skip ahead here um, and touch upon the different types of stormwater permits I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about construction or industrial uh, stormwater permits, but I did want to um, acknowledge that those exist as well. So the construction stormwater permits are going to set the standards for um, earth, earth disturbances, um, and that includes practices while construction is underway, 
and also post-construction stormwater management practices um, that um, control the, the stormwater management coming off that development. And there are also industrial permits for stormwater for industrial facilities that really try to um, protect our streams from any, any type of pollutants that might be coming from industrial sites. So um, the one that's coming to my mind right now, um, landfills, um, they have an industrial stormwater permit, but there's a whole host of, I wanna say between 20 and 30 different types of facilities, possibly more um, that are required to have this type of a stormwater permit. But really I wanna to touch upon the municipal MS4 stormwater permit. And, and Sarah um, mentioned the difference between a combined sewer overflow, a CSO, and the separate system. Um, and so MS4s are for the, the separate, separate system where the water goes into the storm drains and then it's piped directly into a, a creek or a stream um, without any treatment. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're owned by governments. It's a conveyance of systems um, and it's most importantly, not a um, combined sewer system or part of a public treatment facility. And so across the state, there are approximately 1,000 um, municipalities do have an MS4 permit. You can see them in this map um, in the orangish, yellowish um, <laughs> uh, colored um, municipalities. And this permit began in 2003. It is, a, um, um, it is administered by the Department of Environmental Protection. And of course the permit holder is the municipality themselves. And in Erie, there are 11, um, 11 local governments that do hold an MS4 permit. And as part, you know, so I wanted to kind of share with you what, what's, what's, what makes up a stormwater permit, what does it mean? Um, and there are these six, MCM stands for minimum control measure. There are six of them that make up the permit. So the first two are really on public education, outreach, involvement. So there are things municipalities have to do to educate um, residents on um, the impacts of stormwater, um, how, how the municipality is solving that, how residents may. Um, and the in public involvement and participation um, MCM is really bringing um, residents into um, maybe like a public comment on the permit, involving them in decision making, um, things like a trash pickup the municipality could do, just really activating residents to get involved um, in stormwater management with the, with the local government. The third one is illicit discharge detection and elimination. And so this means that there's some particular pollutant or, or source of, of pollutant that's entering the, the MS4 system, the separate sewer system um, that uh, the municipality has to have a hotline for people to call and complain um, or, or some form of um, way for residents to complain and, and um, also address those. And then four and five kind of go back to the construction um, permitting that I was talking about and, and the responsibilities the municipalities have around that. And then number six, uh, municipalities have to um, do good housekeeping. So what are they doing on, on their facilities um, to prevent stormwater from um, stormwater runoff, stormwater pollutants from entering our streams? And so currently we have um, additional measures in our, our permit, um, and I'll go into them a little further, um, that have to uh, address those impaired waters. So those red squiggly lines on the maps that you saw, um, if there's an athamine drainage um, impairment, which I'm pretty sure Erie does not have that any legacy coal mining <laughs> issues, but that is one of them across the state that must be addressed pathogens, so things like, you know, is there too much dog waste, like Sarah um, described, you know, impacting our, our streams. Um, there's the priority organic compounds, um, so PCBs, pesticides, and others. And then there's the pollutant reduction plans for nutrient and sediment pollution. And if you're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, you have to do one if you're um, MS4. 
And if you have impaired waters that are impaired for nutrients or sediment, you have to address that. And you have to do a 10% um, a reduction in, in your, your sediment you have to address. And so I wanted to share a bit about what makes up a pollution reduction plan. I mean, really the, the heart of it is addressing that 10% reduction um, to improve the impaired waterway and, and clean it up and make it healthier. Um, and so with this, um, you can see here on the slide that um, the, the municipality does have to engage the public specifically around, around these practices that it proposes to do and, and does implement. Um, and they have to map um, how they are calculating their, um, their sediment contributions and their reductions. And of course the, the pollutant of concern, is it sediment, is it organics um, from the previous slide? Um, the calculation of the load, the existing pollution, um, and then the BMPs are the, how are they going to address it? And they also have to show how, uh, how it's going to be funded and how it's going to be maintained um, so that it continues to function. And so the picture here on the screen, and I'll go into green stormwater infrastructure in a little bit, but the picture here on the screen is a, a rain garden, which is one, one um, form of green, green stormwater infrastructure that um, helps to mitigate stormwater. Um, and then so some waters that are impaired, they have a total maximum daily load plan. Some people refer to it as a pollution diet. It's the maximum amount of that particular pollutant that the, the receiving water can, can take and, and still be healthy. Um, and, and so this is the same essentially as the slide before, um, except that um, you can see there's the waste load allocation and the reductions, and that is specific back to how the state has defined um, how, how those pollutants will be addressed within that watershed that's impaired. And so when you talk about solutions and, and regulations and, and these pollutant reduction plans and these total maximum daily loads, um, I really feel that this is moving stormwater management forward. As I previously mentioned, this permit started in 2003. The first time that the permit included this additional component was 2018. Um, really um, trying to address what is um, making our waters not healthy. Um, and, and as I, I showed, um, involving the public in those, those decisions and, and getting their input on what practices and, and where they'll be located is, is an important part of um, dialogue with the community or perhaps uh, watershed organizations um, to um, get the practices in the right places. Um, and, and again, like connecting to organizations, connecting to citizens at all, um, getting everybody involved and making decisions together um, can really um, help the municipality make um, better informed decisions. And all of this leads to healthier rivers. And so real quickly, I wanted to mention, um, some of you may have heard of stormwater fees um, and these fees are to to address the, the services that the municipalities are doing to, to manage their stormwater. Um, and there's a lot that goes into it from, from mapping the system to addressing the pollutants, like I, um, education and, and um, just making sure that they're doing things right. Um, and all of this costs money. And so some municipalities have adopted a fee to um, help pay for that. And um, there, Act 68 of 2013 and Act 123 of 2014 gives the municipalities the authority to set up a stormwater utility to collect those fees. And then Act 62 of 26, 2016 gave second class townships the ability to collect the fee without having to set up an authority, kind of taking that out of the process. But um, currently boroughs, towns, cities, first class townships still have to form that authority to collect a fee. And so green stormwater infrastructure, um, as I've already mentioned, um, this is, um, you know, traditional, well, there is traditional gray infrastructure is, is what we call it, the, the pipes and everything that um, 
make up the stormwater system um, and pipe it out to the, the streams. Green water infrastructure is trying to collect the rainwater, slow it down, absorb it, filter it. Um, um, the definition that we use on, on Penn Futures website is that it's a soil water plant system that intercepts stormwater, filtrates a portion of it into the ground and evaporates a portion into the air. In some cases, we'll release it slowly back into the sewer system. And um, one of the great things about green infrastructure is not only is it managing stormwater, but it's also providing co-benefits, additional benefits to the community um, in addition to managing stormwater. So um, community beautification, um, more habitat for birds and insects and other wildlife, butterflies. Um, it can improve public health. It can um, decrease um, urban heat island effect. Um, and um, you know, it all takes, it all is, um, creates jobs to, to install these practices and keep them properly maintained. And it's just a short list of all the many co-benefits. Um, so for some examples, I had already mentioned the rain garden in a previous slide and, and um, you'll see all of the pictures at this point forward are coming from the Philadelphia Water Department. We do have a campaign in Philadelphia called Keep Philadelphia Green and Waters Clean that really tries to elevate green stormwater infrastructure as um, a, an, a, a top key environmental priority to to the elected officials there and also residents. Um, and, and Philadelphia is a CSO, a combined sewer overflow. Um, and so they um, are trying to address that um, with green infrastructure in part because of the community benefits, but also because of its cost effectiveness as opposed to expensive gray um, traditional infrastructure. So um, here's, here's an example, and this is a rain garden. I mean, you can tell by the, the size of the plants here on the left, um, it's newly planted um, rain garden. It's not full and grown in yet, but um, you can see on the left, it's dry. And then on the right, I like this because you can see it in action. It, it's holding that water back, right? Keeping it from the stream, slowing it down. Um, so it can be absorbed or, or later slowly released. Um, and and, and um, you can kind of tell better on the picture on the right, they're, they're um, kind of depressed so that they collect water like a basin. Stormwater bump outs are another example. Um, so you can see here on the picture on the left, I'm gonna use my mouse, hopefully you can see it. Here you have the, the curb, you have a, an intersection and you can see here that it's out it's extended a little further and over here as well. Um, and then over on the right, you can see a, a smaller version of that where the, the curve is extended. And um, I don't know how well you can see it, but right here you can see there's an inlet. Um, so this is collecting water from the road. It might be collecting water from the sidewalk as well, but the water goes into the system um, and, and there it can um, be stored and um, uh, water, water the plants uh, as they need it. And um, talking about co-benefits, one thing that stormwater bump outs can do is they can calm traffic and slow it down um, on, on busy streets that people are known for speeding. So that's a additional benefit there. Here's an example of a tree trench on the right. You can see there's several trees in a line. And then on the left, um, this is a, a sign or an educational piece from the Philadelphia Water Department. And I'm gonna use my cursor here again. Uh, you can see the water um, coming in here from the storm drain and going down. And then um, all of this is connected underground. And of course there's the, the soils are altered and there's um, like uh, stones and it's all meant to absorb the, hold the rainwater um, for, for the trees there in the trench. The stormwater planner is kind of the mini version of that. Um, it's collecting the, the rainwater there on the sidewalk um, and it has the, the plants um, there to help soak it up, use it and um, evapotranspirate it into the atmosphere. And green roofs are another uh, type of example of green stormwater infrastructure. It could be covering a whole roof or a part of a roof. Um, 
In the picture on the right here, you can kind of see various levels of roof um, and you can see some plants over here, some plants up top here, and then some plants here in the, the foreground. Um, and then here on the right, you can kind of see there's a walkway. I, I believe this is at a, a school university and um, there's like a, like a seating study area up there. I saw in one of the pictures. Um, and so it's another way to um, collect water and, and, and use the plants to help manage it. Um, green, green roofs um, can also help um, um, with um, so the summer heat um, to help kind of cool a, cool a building in the summertime. And I believe this is my last example. Um, porous pavement or porous pavers. This is the, the more of the pavement here. Um, the, you can see the image on the left. Um, it must be a, an opening ceremony or something, but um, they're pouring the water into the, the surface, into the, the concrete, and it's just soaking right in. Um, and you can do this with basketball courts. There can be an infiltration trench below, just uh, or like a storage basin, just holding the water. Um, and, and this can be done, um, the image on the right, you can see that it's being done as a parking lot. And then you can also see here that there's um, uh, divots here in the curb and, and um, like, a, like a rain garden sort of um, green water, stormwater infrastructure there um, absorbing the water from the, the parking lot as well. And so lastly, I just wanted to talk about things you can do at home to help manage stormwater on your property. And at the top here, this top image, you can see that's the porous pavers, um, the paver version of the, the concrete from the previous pictures. And somebody has a really nice patio set up here with that. Um, rain barrels are another way um, to collect rainwater from your, your roof, um, divert it, and you can slowly release it when it's not raining or water your plants. And then the image here, um, the bottom right, is a, um, a downspout planter. So the water is, is coming down from the gutters um, and, and into this, this beautiful planter right there. Um, and um, yeah, you can do the, the green roof from the previous slides. You can do that at your house as well. Um, but some other things you can do, you just reducing your impervious surface. Planting native plants is, is good all around, um, good for wildlife, good for insects and butterflies and bees. And um, um, sometimes native plants can be helpful with um, stormwater management. Uh, and Sarah talked about the fertilizer runoff and the pesticides and herbicides. So just reducing that. Um, one thing you can do is you can get a, um, a soil test to um, see what fertilizers your lawn may need or may not need. Uh, and lawn mowing, um, a good practice is to keep your lawn, um, your lawn mower at three inches. And the, the deeper the roots of, of, of your grass, um, the better the, the rain can make its way into the soil. Um, and keeping leaves and grass on the lawn is a good practice um, and definitely much better than it ending up in a storm drain and clogging that. I'm sure we've all seen um, some street flooding from some clogged um, storm drains. And Sarah has already mentioned the pet waste and uh, picking up after your pet is, is a great thing that you can, an easy and great thing that you can do. And that's the, the end of my uh, presentation. So I will leave my, my contact and Sarah's contacts up for, for a minute or so um, so you have the opportunity to, to jot that down. And, and Renee, I wanna thank you. And Sarah, I wanna thank you. Um, both of you covered a lot of ground in a little amount of time. So we're grateful for that. And we do wanna save some time for some questions. So we're gonna jump into those. Uh, and, and Sarah, if I can, I want to come back to you um, and ask you, what's happening locally uh, in, in Erie County, local efforts, what are being undertaken to address some of these stormwater issues and concerns? What can we point to right now? So one thing that we see, uh, uh, we see in a lot of municipalities in Erie County is street sweepers. You might not see that as a stormwater um, pollution, you know, stormwater protection, but by cleaning up a lot of the, the debris that's on those streams, it prevents it from, from running off into the drains. Um, also, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of any municipality that has a long, a, a plan to implement green stormwater infrastructure, uh, you know, as a whole part of their stormwater 
management. I hope, you know, that's one of the things that I hope that Penn Future can, can um, work toward is developing those plans locally. But um, I will say that, you know, Mill Creek Township is a really good example of, you know, they're starting to put in, um, implement some of these, I, these newer ideas. Um, so Mill Creek and the city of Erie, I don't remember when it started, but they're both undergoing and pretty close to finishing up a feasibility study to look at the, their stormwater plans and implementing perhaps those stormwater fees. Um, I'll also say Mill Creek passed an ordinance um, requiring pervious space in parking lots. I think it's 7% and they have recommendations for, for what should be implemented and how many trees should be planted in or and that is that is based on stormwater management. Um, the city of Erie has the something similar down in their uh, waterfront district where you have to plant the trees and you'll see in the development down there, that's why there are trees planted there um, and, and other open spaces. I think it's, um, go ahead. Sorry, continue, Sarah. There, there's more. I, I thought you were finished. Go on. No, there's there is more. Um, so the city of Erie received a grant from the EPA recently um, that allows them to plant or install soil cells that are going to be going in downtown. And so those soil cells are, I, I think they're the same thing as the tree trenches that Renee showed. And so the, it's not just about planting trees, but it's about installing, and maybe you noticed this when Renee was going through green stormwater infrastructure, these are well-planned, engineered ways to manage stormwater that also incorporate plants. And so in addition to just planting trees, you have these soil cells and pervious pavers on top of them that allow the tree roots to get the water they need and the space and the air that they need to be healthy. And that keeps the trees healthier too. What I like about that- There are is, other things happening too, but I'll, I'll only stop there. I was gonna say, what, what I love about this is there, there are a lot of things happening and it's uh, it, at times D, all of the above. It's A and B and C all uh, happening concurrently. So it's, it's great to see that compounding uh, effect of what we can do uh, where it's not just perhaps choose one, uh, but we can really do more than one thing at a time. I wanna turn to an audience question. Uh, because this person's concerned, I, I think uh, many viewers are probably thinking this right now, what can they do? What can the average citizen do? And this person is saying, if citizens have concerns about surface uh, runoff and stormwater issues, uh, do they advocate at the local level in the uh, Lake Erie uh, Basin ar around Erie County or, or uh, at the state level through Act uh, 220 and or the State Water uh, Management Act regarding compliance and regulations examples please so they're looking for places to be pointed to you know where do we go locally do we go at the state level uh sarah can i start with you and then we go to renee uh for some local uh guidance and then some statewide guidance sure so i would say if you have a have a concern a specific concern um that you should contact your municipality um, your government about that specific concern so that it can be addressed um but yeah, Renee mentioned the involvement of public, you know, public involvement. And I think that that's really important and something across, not just with environmental work. And I think I've mentioned this in previous Jefferson presentations too, that, you know, public comments and um, participating in those opportunities for, for public to get involved is a really good way to be, to um, impact stormwater and, and have concerns addressed at the state level too. Renee, maybe you can answer that a little bit more clearly than I did. Renee, if, yeah, if, if a citizen wants to take this all the way up to the state level or what kind of state resources might they have access to that they could then bring into a discussion with the local municipality at the state level, where do we go? Well, you know, I, I definitely just want to um, hit back on the point about getting involved with your municipality. Stormwater is managed at the local level. Um, most of the time, particularly where there are the MS4 permits. So that, that, yeah, that would be my first um, answer. But at the state level, um, the, I would say perhaps the regional DEP office that is um, kind of the next level up overseeing that stormwater permit could be a good place to learn more um, about, about um, what's happening in the area with stormwater permits. Um, 
Penn State extension is, um, uh, well, I guess this is not, this is going back to the local level, <laughs> but Penn State Extension is starting a master watershed steward program um, in Erie County, I believe this year or next year. Um, so that's another way to get educated and get involved and also educate others um, once you become a master watershed steward or, or work on projects. Um, um, that's, that would be another great um, area. And yeah, I'm, I, I love that Act 220 was brought up. The um, the uh, oh my gosh, it's it's escaping my mind right now. The uh, water water use water use plan. Um, oh, the words aren't coming to me. But yeah, that that is an active um, plan right now. That um, um, there are regional committees. There's information on DEP's website about that. Um, and that now would be the time if you want to um, have input on, on that plan, now is the time. Ben, I wanted to add locally, we also, the, the Erie County Conservation District is a, has a wealth of knowledge um, related to stormwater too. And so they're, they're another local resource. And, and uh, I know we've heard uh, all politics are local, but I think climate stewardship for learning is local. That's where it's starting. That's where we've got to get active and involved. Uh, Renee, I want to come back to you for a second um, because you had highlighted uh, some examples there toward the end of your presentation, particularly drawing from Philadelphia. I, I love the keep it green, keep the water clean. Uh, wondering where else we can look uh, for comparables uh, statewide, nationwide, um, you know, metros, municipalities that are getting this right or are leading by good example that we might want to turn our attention to. Where else other than Philadelphia can we look to? Well, right here in the state, we can look to both um, Lancaster is, is doing a great job with green water infrastructure. Again, um, also they have a combined sewer overflow that they are trying to address through green stormwater infrastructure and lots of great examples there. Harrisburg um, is also um, following in those footsteps as well. They're a little, new, a little further behind, a little newer to the process. Um, but they are also um, going, um, implementing green stormwater infrastructure. And um, I, maybe Sarah could speak more to this, but I believe that Pittsburgh is also um, doing some green stormwater infrastructure work as well. But I, I don't have a, a ton of, you know, being in the central part of the state, I'm, I, I know most about what I know here. Sarah, Pittsburgh. Yes, sorry, I had a disruption over here. Um, as far as Pittsburgh goes, yes, they are implementing some stormwater. I don't know to what degree. Um, I actually noticed in, in a trip to Pittsburgh that um, they had this, you know, it was a um, storm drain and you saw plants pl planted right next to that storm drain. And so it you know, allows that filtration and slowing down before it enters. So I do know that this is happening at some level in Pittsburgh. And I think they're, they're exploring how to implement it further. It, one thing that, that comes to mind, and this has come up in conversations about Erie too, is that how do you do this when the, when the city is built out? And um, I, I think it's important to note that if, if you're committed to implementing green stormwater infrastructure, there are ways, you can find ways to implement it like the soil cells downtown, or when you're doing a major renovation, you have to dig up that sidewalk anyway, you can dig further and you can implement a storm stormwater system, a green stormwater and system. What I hear you saying there, Sarah, is that that is one of the challenges uh, when it's already built out and, and how do you break through? And so I, I wanted to ask both of you, what, what are the most pressing or most common barriers that we see that uh, otherwise would uh, slow or challenge the implementation of best, you know, best management practices. So what do you see being the, the biggest challenges? Uh, Renee, can we start with you and then we'll go to Sarah? I, you know, I think, I think funding definitely it comes to top of mind. Um, and, and we do do a lot of advocacy work at the state level and federal level, but um, at the state level in particular, um, trying to increase funding for these kinds of practices. Um, you know, I mentioned stormwater fees. That's a definite way that um, it, it can be done very equitably based on impervious surface as Sarah talked about impervious surface and she showed that um, satellite image of Erie where you could really see all the impervious surface that's impacting our, our stormwater runoff and our, the health of our streams. Um, 
And, and I think that there's a lot of stigma that comes around with fees because people don't understand that it's really a service that the municipality is providing. Sarah, to you, what do you see being the barriers, the, the blockers to getting uh, best management practices implemented? Uh, like Renee said, I, I would say funding is probably the number one. Well, funding for planning um, all the way through implementation and maintenance. Um, so funding is a big one, but I also think this is a, it's a, di it's different than the way that we've always done things. So uh, it's a barrier that it's a change in the way things are done. We have to look at it differently. Um, it's not just about pipes and, and the underground system, but it's also about implementing these green, um, these green elements. And, and that can be really hard to kind of wrap your head around, especially when, you know, there are a lot of people who may not buy into it. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is maintenance. That's a, that's a big thing that gets left out of the equation. It's really important that these, you can imagine what a rain garden looks like if you don't go in and maintain it, you know, it needs to be weeded. You have to pull the, the litter out of it as it, as it gets, um, you know, or as time goes on. And so maintenance is a big problem too. So we're almost out of time here, and and uh, I want to sneak one more question in. And uh, you know, for those watching, um, you know, for those wondering next steps, where to go, what they should take away, what they should start talking to other citizens about, start talking to their municipalities about. Uh, what do you each see as one of the most critical things to take away from this presentation here when we're looking at uh, stormwater runoff, its impacts, and its solutions? Renee, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Sarah. I think, you know, getting involved and, and becoming educated and, and talking to your local municipality. Um, I think municipal governments need to hear that um, citizens are concerned about this and, and hear about the impacts and, and hear the local stories, hear the, the, your story about how it's impacting you or um, maybe your favorite stream. Um, I'll add, you know, if the number one takeaway I think from this is that um, every uh, our activities directly impact our waterways and that everything that, that hits the ground outside or, or the top of our buildings eventually runs off into our waterways, it gets out into our Great Lakes system and also gets into the oceans. And so knowing that, making, making our own individual decisions to make sure that we don't um, contribute to the problem there. And then like Renee said, I'll, I'll, say, I'll kind of echo that, that letting your um, local officials and your state officials know that this is a priority to you is really important. Okay, you're gonna have to forgive me because I'm gonna sneak one more question in. We got another one from the audience and I wanna ask it because I think this is an important one. You talked about ordinances and how we can change things. And I'm recalling a, a past presentation we had here, um, a, a, a JES digital program, uh, where we were talking to somebody in Germany where they said part of their new ordinance, their city council passed an ordinance that all new builds would have to have green roofs. And I, and I, I found that fascinating that that was a path they were taking. This person is turning attention to what can we do about pervious paving for parking lots. Uh, in Erie, in the suburbs, we're seeing a lot of that gray area from that map, Sarah. So are there any chance of finding a way to get that to be required? Uh, can we pass ordinances? Can we do something uh, policy-wise to actually make that happen? This person's pointing out there are demonstrations in Erie that show this is working from uh, Trek, the Tom Ridge Environmental Center, to the Art Museum and elsewhere. They're saying they work. What can we do to get more of this done? I think highlighting that, the, that it does exist and it can work in Erie is really important. Um, again, I think elevating it to the level of the municipality, these residents can say, and you can go to uh, any public event uh, or a public meeting and say, hey, this is happening. This is really good for our stormwater. It, it will slow things down and allow uh, water to infiltrate into the soil. Let's think about this. And at least that kind of, and you, you got to do it a couple of times, you know, raise it to the level of awareness and let, let your elected officials know that that's important to you. Sarah, I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to read one of the comments uh, weighing in. Pittsburgh has been adding tree watering reservoirs for years. Glad to see it's taking place in Erie. Another person says water is life, important stuff. Thanks, Renee and Sarah. So I want to say the same thing. Sarah Bennett, Renee Reber, uh, Penn Futures Campaign Managers for Clean Water. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your expertise. 
uh, your insight, taking the time, energy, and effort to share that with us here in conversation, a special program between JES and Penn Future to talk about stormwater runoff, its impacts and solutions to and ways to address those impacts. Thank you, thank you, thank you both uh, so very much. Sarah, for folks looking uh, to access Our Water, Our Future is a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed and to learn more about the work you're doing with Penn Future, remind them where to head. Yep, they can go to penfuture.org and if they just look for the Erie Common Agenda, they'll find it there. They can also reach me at Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T -T, at penfuture.org. Appreciate that. And Renee, for folks looking to plug into the work you're doing in the center of Pennsylvania, in the Susquehanna Basin, uh, folks looking to follow along all of your work, how do they connect with you? Uh, Reber at penfuture.org, R-E-B as in boy, E-R at penfuture.org. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And folks, thank you for tuning in to watch, whether you're watching live on the JES Facebook page or catching a later broadcast, streaming this on demand or listening to this on demand. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. These programs cannot happen without you, the audience. These conversations, these discussions, you are integral to this and we thank you for that. A friendly reminder to stream other JES digital programs on demand, head over to our website, jeserie.org. There you're going to find out um, more details about more upcoming JES digital programs, as well as a wide range of publications from quick timely reads to reports, essays, and more, all available free to download. And of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.